All right, well, let's get started. Um, first of all, good morning to everyone and welcome to our webinar. Um, we're gonna walk through talking about improving the student acquisition process and leveraging um, predictive modeling. Just a, a few notes, um, the session is being recorded and will be sent out afterwards. Um, and then secondly, as we're going through, if you have questions, um, there, you can enter those in the chat or the Q&A area uh, as well. Um, so just real quick uh, from a, um, our topics perspective, um, we're going to walk through, you know, what are some of the industry trends and some observations. We're going to have an interactive um, discussion with, with Pearson. Uh, Pearson's going to walk us through you know, what does a day in the life of an enrollment advisor look like at Pearson? And then after that, you know, hearing and seeing all this, you know, you guys will probably have some questions and um, we'll kind of talk through, you know, how do you get there? Where do you get started? Those types of things. Uh, then we'll transition into uh, the Q&A session. So um, just real quick from an intro perspective of the presenters, so my name is Brian Walker. I am a client partner here at Atrium. And I've spent the past 20 years working with organizations on improving their customer and employee experience. Um, we're also joined by Lindsay Bond. And Lindsay is a uh, senior data analyst at Pearson in their online learning services. So just a couple of things that we want to start off with. So enterprise systems are going through an evolution uh, and a transformation over the past few decades. You think about the 80s, 90s, um, there was a single system um, that folks were moving towards where, hey, how can we track all of our finance processes, all of our employees and all of our customers in, into a single system? Um, move forward to the 2000s and it was, we've got a ton of data. How can we get that data out to our folks so that they can engage with the data through you know, some of their mobile technology, you know, via social uh, chat, web, et cetera. And then fast forward to today, um, you know, how can we use that data to drive intelligent recommendations and intelligent automation and notifications and intelligent analytics for folks? Um, so, you know, at Atrium, what we focus on, we focus on unlo unlocking the data you spent years collecting and using that data to drive actions. So we blend business strategy with Salesforce clouds and other third party, party data along with data science, um, really to take a data driven approach with our customers. Um, we help our customers focus on some high impact use cases. And really the goal is how can you better your business and better some of the outcomes for your business? Um, so there was a recent Gartner study uh, around artificial intelligence and analytics and some trends. And there were some staggering numbers that came out of this. Um, $2.9 trillion of business value and 6.2 million hours of worker productivity in 2021 will be created by artificial intelligence. The primary area is going to be around customer experience, and that's how you know AI is going to deliver most of this business value. You know those customers who have begun their AI journey, they've seen some of these benefits, where forty-five percent of those customers have recognized the revenue benefit of up to ten percent, and fifty percent have seen a cost benefit of up to 20%. So there are some challenges as well. Um, you know, if we take a look at, uh, you know, there's 70% of organizations who don't have a data-driven strategy. And there's 58% of organizations who are not using their data or analytics as a competitive advantage for them. There's even a higher percentage of folks who are pointing to you know, hey, it's not the technology, it's more the people in process that I'm worried about that I haven't, you know, that's one of the reasons why we have not gotten started. Um, 
taking a look at uh, you know some of the trends in the educational technology space, you know there's trends around lifelong learning. Um, you know it's becoming more of a journey for folks. You know people are looking to upskill, increase their skills and their job satisfaction, um, and look at better professional or different professional opportunities and organizational growth. There's an increased demand um, around e-learning, and we've all felt it over the past, you know, call it 18 months, you know, getting uh, getting things online. And um, you know, you look at specific verticals, you know, especially around healthcare and nursing. There's a lot of uh, uptick in in e-learning as well. You know, some of that's due to uh, connectivity and convenience of, you know, hey, I can learn anytime, anywhere. There's also an increased use of artificial intelligence and having that embedded in learning um, to provide more personalization. And not only in learning, but also in marketing to potential students or recruiting of potential students. So how can we make that more, um, you know, you know it more personalized for organizations or, or for students? And uh, finally, cost. You know, there's a continuing trend around cost you know, how can you keep education reasonable so that it can be expanded to all socioeconomic groups and provide the ability to attract more and more students? So there's, there's a lot going on in the world of technology, in the world of education technology. And I wanna invite Lindsay Bond to join us and we're gonna walk through some questions. So Lindsay, are you there? Yeah, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, and thank you for joining us. Um, so, hey, Lindsay, maybe you can tell us a little bit, uh, you know, introduce yourself and, and your role at Pearson. Yeah, sounds great. So I am a senior data analyst and manager on the data and analytics team for Pearson North America Online Learning Services. Um, and I've been at Pearson for about eight years um, in different roles around the company, um, but all related to using data to inform business decisions. Awesome, thank you. And maybe you could take a second, tell us a little bit about Pearson, and some of the things that, that you do. Yeah, so I'll focus on kind of Pearson Online Learning Services Group. Uh, so we provide marketing, recruitment, and student support services for colleges and universities, online degree programs, so both undergraduate programs and graduate programs. Um, and so my team in particular builds dashboards, predictive and forecasting models, um, and does ad hoc analyses to support those three functions um, with data and insights. Great. Well, thank you for that. And um, so you started down a path of really taking a look at your processes, optimizing your processes, you know, really to give better insights into what you're doing and those processes and how to make them more efficient. Um, maybe you can tell us where'd you start um, what did you start with? Was there a business case? You know, maybe you can, can give us some insights into that. Yes, yeah, so we actually started maybe a bit out of order because we started um, using the predictive model capabilities of Einstein discovery a few years ago. So that was even before you know, we as an organization were on Salesforce. Um, and really the question that we had and what we were looking into is, um, we were interested in seeing if we could see patterns across our universities and college partners um, in factors that impact a student's likelihood to enroll. Um, so we worked with Atrium a few years ago to start learning how to use the Einstein discovery tool, how to build kind of predictive models with that tool, um, knowing that we'd likely be moving into Salesforce um, as an organization. And then in um, spring of 2020, we moved our recruitment and student support functions onto Salesforce. Um, and so in those first rounds of models, we weren't really operationalizing anything um, from a predictive standpoint. We were more looking at kind of just looking for the insights. What are those potential factors that could impact a student's likelihood to enroll? Um, and then when we moved on to Salesforce, we wanted to get those insights embedded in front of our enrollment advisors. So those are the uh, people who work with, directly with potential students. Um, so to get those insights in front of those enrollment advisors in real time um, was our goal kind of after we moved to Salesforce. And that was, did I say, in spring of 2020 was when we moved them. Awesome. Um, 
So maybe can you touch on your, you mentioned your enrollment advisors and kind of making their process better. Maybe talk about what was the process beforehand and, you know, how did you envision changing that process? Yeah, so we actually, um, you know, we built these predictive models uh, where we had some insights on, you know, these are the types of things that impact a student's likelihood to enroll. But then when we moved to Salesforce, we realized that we ran into kind of a more critical problem than just the getting those predictive insights in front of our enrollment advisors. Um, so we didn't have a great data and reporting strategy in place when we moved to Salesforce. Uh, so what happened was that we had a ton of individually created dashboards that were all out there created by either the recruitment managers or the enrollment advisors themselves. And so there just wasn't a single source of truth anymore um, with hundreds of dashboards all across the different recruitment teams. And so there was a lot of confusion on kind of what are the right numbers and the right KPIs to look at. I um, mean, we spent a lot of time in meetings just looking at like, why is this number different from that number and kind of behind the scenes trying to figure out when they're supposed to be representing the same thing. Um, and it definitely, you know, wasn't a good use of anybody's time. So um, in addition to kind of surfacing the predictive model scores, we sat down and said, well, we desperately need a centralized dashboard um, to be able to provide the enrollment advisors with a consistent source of truth and a consistent process and how to use data in their day to day. Uh, so they had moved to work from home at the exact same time that we moved to Salesforce, because that was in spring of 2020. We didn't have consistent dashboards. So it was really for us, we were looking for a way to provide more consistent direction on where the team should be using data, how they should be spending their time and day to day um, in their activities, and then how we could share best practices, knowing that some of the teams had created their own dashboards and were using them really well, how we could share best practice with teams that maybe hadn't done that um, so that we could kind of use the learnings from those high performing teams that were using data well to create a more centralized process for all of our recruitment teams. That's great. It sounds like, uh, you know, challenging with, you know, folks moving from being in the office to being remote. And I'm, I'm sure that that was, uh, that, that was a challenge for you as you were rolling things out and trying to get uh, consistent across the board. Um, how about your data? Can you talk about that? You know, a lot of customers, you know, they want to get started, um, but they don't think that they have the data to, to support, you know, predictive analytics or analytics um, or a single source of the truth. Maybe you can talk about some of the things that, uh, that you did um, to kind of move past that. Yeah, so we, um, the original predictive models that we had were based off of our old CRM data. So we had built those a couple years, started building those out a couple years ago. Um, so when we moved to Salesforce, uh, we had to rebuild the models to align to that new data model in Salesforce. And so we debated for a long time whether it made sense to kind of wait until the Salesforce data had matured um, to build those models or to go ahead with what we'd already done and try and make a best of both worlds situation. Um, and so we decided to go ahead because we found enough kind of common features between the data model from our old CRM and our new CRM um, being Salesforce. And so, um, and then we just said, well, we know we've got some new information from the move to Salesforce that we're not going to be able to include it right away because we don't have historical data that we could put into the predictive model. Um, but we'd be able to do that in future iterations of the model. So the approach we took was to build the model off of an external data set uh, that we housed in our, we've got a BigQuery uh, enterprise data warehouse that we have. Um, and so we built the model off of the old data, but transformed into the new Salesforce model um, and then score results in Salesforce. And so that was kind of the um, uh, short-term solution that we had just because we knew we didn't have the history in the new platform, but we still wanted to be able to leverage the insights that we had seen. Um, and so, uh, we, you know, we've got plans to kind of revamp the models. Now we've been on Salesforce for about a year and a half. So we have a lot more history um, and kind of start incorporating some of those new features that we weren't able to previously because we didn't have the history. Um, but that was kind of the approach that we took was um, let's do the best we can, knowing that we're going to have some, uh, some gaps in data that we'd like to use, but let's use what we have available to us. Awesome. 
Oh, that's great. And maybe talk about, um, you know, today where you are with, with the project. Yeah, so we um, started kind of by working with our stakeholders uh, really to separate the needs from the wants in a dashboard because we found when we started talking to folks, um, everybody wanted everything. <laughs> and so we had to really pare down. We focused specifically on kind of the KPIs and the metrics that uh, push for action. So that was our primary for, uh, focus, is this gonna be an actionable data point? Um, and then from there, we moved into kind of building on a data flow um, in Tableau CRM, integrating the predictive models that we already had built into that data flow. Um, and then we built the dashboard, gathered initial rounds of feedback. And so where we are right now is that we're in user testing. So we've got a group of, I think about 10 enrollment advisors, plus a handful of their managers that are using the dashboard live um, and they'll be using it, I think for the next month or two um, and providing feedback uh, based off of that test period. Um, and so that's where we are now. And then we'll roll that out um, kind of waiting until after fall semesters close um, to make any big changes uh, within that recruitment services organization. Okay, great. And then it sounds like you took phased uh, approach or you know, did you go by business unit? You know, maybe talk about how did you, uh, you know, decide to like which areas to roll it out to first and initially? Yeah, so we started, so as I said at the beginning, we support our marketing recruitment services and student support um, functions uh, within the organization. Um, but we started with the recruitment services function um, kind of as the low hanging fruit in the fact that it was the biggest need. We knew that there, um, the dashboards they were using were kind of all over the place. We knew that was a big need. Um, and it was also the area we had the most uh, complete data set. So most of recruitment services data lives within either the old CRM or within Salesforce. And so we were able to kind of uh, move quickly because we had a lot of the data that we um, needed right away. Um, and definitely have plans to expand to marketing and student support, but I think we just need to do um, gather a lot more data because there's a lot more external sources of data that exist in those in those functions. Um, and then we moved, uh, we've got, you know, a wide variety of college and university partners. So that was the other kind of focus area that we decided on was that um, we would start with our enterprise partners rather than kind of rolling out to everyone all at the same time, um, which has allowed us to kind of keep our stakeholder group a little bit smaller. Um, but also our enterprise partners have higher volumes of inquiries, um, higher programs, higher prospective students. Um, and so that just allowed us to start with a bigger volume of data that we could take those learnings um, to the other programs and partners, as well as um, just be able to know, kind of think, it's a little more complicated to think through how you handle some of those smaller data volumes um, and where you group them and how you group them. It's just uh, easier for us to start with our larger partners. Gotcha, great. Um, how about touching on your team and what does your team look like? How's it comprised? Yes, yeah, so we just hit our one year anniversary, I think like last week. Um, so that's exciting. Um, as I said, I've been at Pearson for about eight years, but it's, I haven't, I'm a data analyst by trade, but I have not been on a team except for in this last year. Um, so we've got a team of about seven um, of analysts, um, managers, reporting analysts, um, and then kind of more technical data on the data science uh, side of things as well. Um, but we are uh, going to double the size of our team in the next couple months. Um, so we've got a lot of positions open for analysts and data governance and data quality. Um, and so I think a project like this one, you know, despite the fact that we didn't touch the whole organization that we work with, our data wasn't perfect. Um, but what it did was kind of show the value of the data and analytics team. And I think that's one of the main reasons we were kind of given the opportunity to say, yeah, go hire more people. We need to do more of this. That's great. And congrats on your one year anniversary there. Um, sounds like you guys are doing some great things. Um, so, and, you know, you talked about where you are today, you know, maybe talk about the vision for Einstein, TCRM, you know, what other types of outcomes are you looking to drive? Are there KPIs that you're looking to focus on in the future? Yeah, so we think, you know, for us, uh, we'd like TCRM to be kind of the one-stop shop for um, analytics and reporting 
um, specifically for our functions that work in Salesforce every day. So that would be kind of our recruitment services organization and the student support organizations. So we'd like to expand into um, retention analysis and being able to use TCRM to do that. Um, uh, we also use Tableau itself as our other kind of source of reporting. So I think, um, you know, first that's another interesting place to go next is kind of what is the connection between those two tools and how are they gonna continue to integrate more fully? Um, so that is, um, you know, another place that we'll go because we'll continue to use Tableau for our teams that don't live within Salesforce. Um, but we'll definitely be tracking adoption of the dashboards. We've got an adoption um, dashboard up to track who's using, how often are they using, which dashboards are they using. Um, with this project, we'll be tracking kind of enrollment advisor satisfaction. So how is this actually improving um, their training and their day-to-day -day work? Um, and then always tracking pipeline improvements um, when talking about recruitment specifically. So, you know, we're we seeing increases in conversion between an opportunity, which is a qualified student, and then an actual enrollment. How is this actually impacting um, the business as well? That's great. Um, how about uh, any, any parting advice here? You know, if you could go back to you know, one year ago when you, or, or more when you first started this, are there things that you would potentially do differently? Maybe you could share some of the lessons that you've learned? Yes, yeah, so I think I've got a couple of very specific to Tableau CRM and then one maybe more broad um, lesson. Mm -hmm. So from a Tableau CRM perspective, um, and this is from, we had a new analyst who was new to using Tableau CRM for the first time. Um, and her main advice was to utilize the Tableau or utilize, utilize the Trailblazer community. So she said, there's a lot of good info there. If you're not sure about something you could ask and somebody usually replies within a few days. So that's always good to know is that there's a great place to get help. Um, and so she really found that extremely valuable. Um, and then also to perfect and validate your data flow even before starting a dashboard. Um, so that helps with just data validation and you know just in terms of kind of the order of doing things um, and then definitely to identify and figure out what are the limitations of the tool um, early on so i think one of the things that we ran into is some of the metrics that we wanted to present were actually real-time metrics um, and with the data flow we have about a 15 minute lag um, in the metrics and so it was thinking through well which metrics make sense to use as on a 15 minute lag and which are the ones that like would need to be real time and those for those real time metrics to start to maybe just use the Salesforce um, dashboards in themselves. So that was another thing just to know kind of what are the limitations of the tools that you're working with. Um, and then I think more broadly, this is maybe not not a surprise, but change is hard. Um, and especially in the last you know year and a half, we've gone through a ton of change. The world's going through a ton of change. So we had to communicate the purpose of why we were moving to the centralized dashboard many different ways to many different stakeholders. I think we made the mistake early of assuming that a single source of truth was obvious, right? Like everybody wants a single source of truth. Um, that wasn't the case. And I think especially with folks who had created their own dashboards, why are we doing this? So we had to um, over communicate that and just kind of remind ourselves, you can't assume that people understand the benefit without communicating that benefit. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for all that. That was uh, super informative. Um, is it okay if I turned uh, the uh, presenter rights over to you and yeah, we're definitely. gonna walk through a little demonstration? Yes. Okay. All right, let's see if I can get this. Okay, let me know if you can see that, okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So this is, um, this is the dashboard. Uh, so this is uh, what we ended up with and what our um, enrollment advisors that are doing the testing right now are working on. And so this is kind of broken out. We broke it out into three separate components. Um, so the first component here is kind of just this idea of my to do's. So what does my current day look like? Um, and the, you know, the different widgets here allow the enrollment advisor to come in and say, um, what are my current week steps? So what do I have to do today? Um, what do I have that's overdue? Um, what do I have where I haven't, I don't have any next steps set up for that opportunity or for that potential student? Um, when did I last contact 
the students that are in my pipeline? Um, and who has it been a long time, 14 plus days since I last attempted to, to get in contact with that potential student? Um, so they can come in here and click on, for instance, their current week next steps. So say I have three next steps this week um, and see you know, when was the last time I tried to contact those students and then scroll down into kind of the second part of the dashboard, which is the table or the list that shows which potential students you're looking at and what are their opportunities. So this just gives us kind of a, as an enrollment advisor, just an overview of like, what does my current day look like? Who should I, who do I need to start getting in contact with? Where might I be behind um, with the different potential students that are in my pipeline? Um, on the top here, they have the ability to filter uh, to a bunch of different um, ways to look at the data. So they could look by a particular program. What program is the student interested in? What term are they interested in? What stage or status are they currently in? So that just gives them the ability to do um, a lot of different slicing and dicing of, of the data. Uh, and so then from there, they have kind of the second part of the dashboard is their opportunity details. So it's just this table of what are my opportunities? What stage and status are they currently in? Um, what are their, uh, what's the prediction level? Um, and so I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but you can also see when was the day since I last attempted to contact that student? When was that opportunity created? When was my last attempt made? And what's my next step with that student? Um, as well as their program of interest. So this just gives kind of all the details on anything they need to know about that opportunity in one place um, and allows them from this table to click on an opportunity and make a open the record so they can go directly to that record in Salesforce or they can log a new task or activity for that particular opportunity. Um, and so then where we have embedded the predictive models into the dashboard are in a couple different places. The first place is in within this opportunity details table. So it allows them to see for a particular opportunity, what is that level of prediction um, for how likely they are to convert from in sales, which is kind of a qualified uh, potential student um, to applications, so to completing their application. And then how likely are they to convert from that completed application to an actual enrollment? Um, and so for the predictive model, um, those levels are based off of, they're just uh, segments. Um, so a level one um, is the highest likelihood um, to either complete their application or enroll according to the model. And then a level three would be the least likely. So they're broken out into level one, two, and three scores. Um, and that just gives an idea, the advisor an idea early on of where the person stands in terms of how likely they are uh, to pursue their online degree. And so it just gives them an idea when they're talking to the student, is this somebody who's really likely to just kind of move through the recruitment pipeline quickly? They know what they're interested in, they're likely to enroll, or is this a potential student that um, is looking for a little bit more advice and help as they move through that process? So it just gives that initial kind of indication of how likely they are to um, enroll. And from that predictive model standpoint, um, that includes kind of both Static features, so things like, uh, you know, what do we know about the student when they submit an inquiry? What program and term are they interested in? What, you know, where are they located? How far are they from campus? Um, how do they come to find us? What was the kind of marketing effort that kind of hooked them into inquiring um, about a particular program? Um, as well as kind of dynamic features. So how, is our, how are our enrollment advisors interacting with those students? Um, so that would be things like the number of phone calls we've made, what was the task, you know, contact cadence for that student, how long have they sat in a particular recruitment stage, those are other types of variables that are included in the predictive models. And so that just gives, I think, overall um, an initial sense of like, where is this student today um, when, when the enrollment advisor is first communicating with them. So that's kind of the opportunity details. And then the last section um, is the My Insights section. And so this is, gives a little bit more of an overview of how, as an enrollment advisor, um, your pipeline has been looking and how the pipeline has been performing over the past week and month. Um, so it's not so much at this point kind of a day-to-day -day activity, but more, you know, if I'm communicating with my manager and I want to say, 
you know, this week I have accomplished X, you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, you can come down to this, my insights section. You've got an overview of the active pipeline. So, you know, how much, how many students do you have in each of the stages of the pipeline as of today? Um, and all of this data is uh, broken out um, by their predictive mo model score. So from an active pipeline perspective, how many in sales do I have and how many of those in sales are in a particular level of the predictive model? And so you can see um, the red here is level three or level one, excuse me. So that's what um, we'd likely see a lot of level ones moving um, toward the end of the pipeline just because we know they're likely to enroll um, from the moment that they inquire. Um, and so then from there, we've got our current week stage changes and our current month stage changes. So you can see this week, this enrollment advisor has moved two students into the application stage and closed out three opportunities. So they can see kind of how am I, you know, this week, what does my pipeline movement look like, as well as this month. So this month, the student has, or the enrollment advisor has moved five into accepted, 10 into application, one into a completed application file, and then uh, has closed out 72 opportunities. So that might be a good um, place to start with the manager to say, you know, that 72 closed opportunity seems high. Can we dig into those and say, what are the reasons that those opportunities have been closing out um, over the past month? And then we also just have the current week applications. Um, applications are a key metric for us in terms of um, how likely are we to hit our enrollment targets uh, for a particular term? Um, and so then that is the dashboard. All right, and Brian, I will pass it back over to you. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much. That was uh, it was really uh, cool to see what uh, what you guys have have done and um, what you guys are still looking to do. So uh, kudos to you and your team. Let me, um... So um, at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about artificial intelligence and you know some of the successes and challenges that customers have had. Um, you know, some of the challenges we saw, you know, 70% of customers do not have a data-driven strategy, 58% are not using data um, as a competitive advantage for them. And, you know, 92% of people that, you know, they're pointing to like their people and their processes. So what we do is we start with our customers um, and really give them kind of a, a, a maturity curve, we call it. Um, which is a data-driven maturity curve. And we try to determine what is your baseline and where are you starting from? So, you know, you can see um, the Chevron down bottom towards the left where most companies are either between, hey, yeah, we've got some standalone reports. And then we have some tools where we have, you know, different dashboards out there um, and we push out some self-service reporting. Um, we move up the curve a little bit and you see that you know some of the early majority customers they're around level three level four they're starting to dip their toe into well let's do some predictions and use some predictive modeling um and you know let that service some insights for us and you know put those insights into context which is my daily you know flow of work um, and then some, you know, other customers, you know, continuing to move up, you'll see that uh, level five, you know, take those insights and make recommendations on, okay, based on those insights, what are some of the next best actions that I can take to improve the results? Um, and then uh, some of our customers are moving towards the innovators, um, you know, they automate that. So, you know, how can I make sure that those actions are automated? either based on approvals or based on, you know, we just want the actions to happen. Um, and that's gonna be based on some of the data thresholds and some of the behaviors of folks. So that's how we start with a, with a baseline for our customers. Um, our approach um, to moving our customers up to uh, up the maturity curve is, you know, one, helping you align on your business objectives and what outcomes you're looking 
not only in one business area, but also across the, the, the organization. Um, and then we'll move into some of the tactics. So specifically defining how you'll realize those objectives. In other words, what use cases you'll focus on for those ob objectives. We'll help you develop a roadmap which will pri prioritize those use cases. Cause a lot of times, you know, with some of the ideation, there'll be um, a number of use cases that'll come up. We'll help you prioritize some of the ones that are gonna make the biggest impact on your business. Um, and then, you know, this is gonna be consumed by people. So who are the personas that these insights are gonna be sent to? They could be, you know, descriptive insights into what has happened or predictive insights um, like Lindsay was showing into what uh, potentially could happen based on based on a model. So, um, you know, identify who those people are who are going to be consuming that data, and then, you know, what actions do we want those folks to take to drive better outcomes? Um, and then finally, from a data perspective, what data is needed to support any insights, decisions, or or some of those actions? So, um, you know, that's a big piece of it as well. So, you know, this is the approach that we take um, to really helping you get started. And we've taken this with a lot of our customers. So um, we know that it can seem daunting, but, uh, you know, we, we've helped a lot of customers kind of get over that initial, uh, initial hump. So with that, um, I'll open it up to... Um, Melissa, I don't know if there's any questions that we have in the in the chat or the Q and A section. Yeah, we've got one question in the chat here for Lindsay. Now that you're live, how are you keeping up with the new requests from the business? Yes, I think we're kind of in a a middle stage of live, right? So we're in that testing stage, and so for immediately with that testing group. Um, we're gathering feedback from that group as they're kind of working with the dashboard this month, um, but we're not making changes until kind of that testing period is over. That was one of the things that we ran into was that we were iterating maybe too much. And so every time we'd share the dashboard with stakeholders, we, you know, get feedback, we'd make the change immediately. And then we'd, you know, realize we reverted too far away from the previous dashboard. And so what we're trying to do this time is collect all of the feedback at once and then kind of then make the second iteration of the dashboard. Um, so that's what this trial period um, is for. And then after that, we've got an intake process set up for the full team um, to kind of take requests for enhancements, improvements, new requests. So we kind of bucket our requests out in, into those groups. Um, and then prioritize them um, over two week uh, sprints. So that's kind of how we're managing our workload uh, as a team right now. Okay, if anyone awesome. else has any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A link. Yeah, while we're, we're doing that, we'll, we'll check one last time, um, but... Um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to offer, so, you know, those who have attended our webinar uh, kind of talked about, you know, that intelligent workshop of, you know, how do you get started? Um, you know, if folks are interested in that, they can contact me, brian.walker at atrium.ai. Um, we can help you define personas, talked about identifying and prioritizing some of your top use cases and creating a roadmap to, um, to get that journey started. So Melissa, any other questions? Uh, we've just gotten another one in. Lindsay mentioned change is hard. What steps have they taken to identify awareness education opportunities for new adopters? Yeah, so we, um, the major things that we have done, um, one is kind of identifying a group of enrollment advisors that, you know, are that are that testing group or are that group that are going to be really excited about it and have um, have a lot of kind of influence over their teams. And so I think that's one place that we've, you know, we started trying to interact with, with the enrollment advisors in that way to say, 
my head, how's it going? You know, are there areas that we need to do better? Where do we need to kind of communicate more? Where's the training challenge? Um, so that's definitely one area. Um, I think another is just in training in general. So rethinking how we do our training in a virtual sense, given that we don't have anyone in the office anymore. Um, we've actually expanded our training team and expanded our QA team on the recruitment side um, to be the group so that we have people who are dedicated to training. So it's not just the analytics team going out and saying, here's your dashboard, let me walk you through it. But it's actually folks who have been in those jobs who are now being the trainers. And then hopefully we have more of kind of a train the trainer um, methodology going forward. So those are just a couple of things we've been working on and we've been communicating with managers a lot more. So it's just been more often and more direct communication about how things are going. That's great. Anything else, Melissa? I don't see any other questions. Um, we can share the poll results if you want to uh, share that with the audience. Oh, yes. Um, we can do that, I think. Oh, there we go. Um, so here's the poll results um, on uh, folks and uh, what uh, what roles they play within their organization. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone. You know, thank you, Lindsay. Um, it was great to to see and hear your process, your progress, and you know, understand the benefits that you've seen with TCRM and um, your dashboards and your models across your organization. So. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to walk through that. Um, I also wanted to thank everyone who is um, on the line. Um, thank you for joining. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions if you guys have some that pop up afterwards. Yeah, I do. I can jump in on this one. I see one more right here. Um, okay. Just asking, um, that we're already seeing an improved win rate. Are the improvements more or less than planned? I would say so far less, um, just because we have not, rolled out the dashboard to the full organization. So um, we'll be able to answer that question a lot better, I think, in a few months, but for now, um, definitely less because we've got a smaller number using it. Awesome. Well, with that, uh, again, thank you everyone and uh, hope that uh, the rest of your day is a great one. Sounds good, thank you. Thanks all, bye.